Take your Bible and turn with me to Acts chapter 19. We're going to pick up this morning, beginning in verse 10 and, and go through verse 20. But what's happening here as we, we come to this particular spot, sort of dropping into the book of Acts, is that in Acts 19, Paul is coming to the city of Ephesus. The, the first passage there, verses 1 through 9, Paul meets these disciples of John who have not yet heard uh, the full gospel of Jesus. They've heard John telling about Jesus, but now uh, Paul's able to come to them and say, Jesus is here. He's been crucified, raised. And so they believe the gospel and are saved. And we're told that Paul stays there in Ephesus. He, he goes during the day, though he, he makes tents in the morning and in the evening. He goes during the day to the hall of Tyrannus and reasons with people, tries to draw them into the gospel. The city of Ephesus is a large port city in, in what is now modern-day Turkey. It was given over to idol worship, to, to magic, to incantations. You're going to see that even within the text this morning. And yet, we see that as Paul's there ministering, we, he has great su success. Many, many people come to faith in Christ through the ministry of Paul, though it is a very dark place. And so Luke writes for us, the same Luke that writes the Gospel of Luke, writes the book of Acts, he writes for, for us, by the Holy Spirit, in verse 10 of chapter 19. This continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom the, was the evil spirit leaped on them and mastered all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. And fear fell upon them all. And the name of Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. We all at, at some point or another in our life have had to answer our question that we weren't really ready yet to answer, that we weren't really prepared for. When I was in college, I had to take a macroeconomics class. I was about as good at that as you would expect me to be. I was pretty lost, and our professor had this, this uh, process where he would keep the role in front of him. I went to a small college. Most of my classes were under 20 people. This was the one class that had like 200 people in it. It was a big lecture hall, and he would keep the roster in front of him, and, and every day he would go through, and when he asked questions, he would just go through the roster and call on somebody, and I, my thought was, my last name starts with a P. I'm pretty far down the list. Right? By the time he gets to me, I might know what's going on. That wasn't true. He he called me like the second week of class. He stopped going in alphabetical order, and I'll never forget, I was sitting in the back left corner of the room, and he calls out, Mr. Parrish, could you explain for the class the chart on page 72? Well, the short answer is no. I could not explain <laughs> the chart on page 72, but I can't say that. And I didn't think that he would accept pass as an answer. Like, could I have another one? Could, I, could you give me an easier question? And so I looked down at the chart on page 72, and I did not understand it. It was a chart about the Great Depression. I knew that because the title said the Great Depression. And so I did my best. I said, you know, is this, this is a chart about the Great Depression. And he said, well, that's not good enough. What does it tell us about the Great Depression? That it is great. That it was, <laughs> that it was a great, not a good depression. It was great, like bad and... People were depressed, and this chart tells us about that. And he kept pressing me before he would eventually move on. I think I will have nightmares about that moment until the day that I die. It will stick in me. We know what it feels like to, to be asked a question, to have an answer demanded of, of us that we're not yet ready to give. Now, I want you to see, as we come to this text, this Acts 19, 10 through 20, 
The, the text asked us a question, but I want you to see it's maybe not the question you think it's asking. The, the Luke bookends this, this narrative for us with, with two similar verses. Right? In verse 10, he tells us that as Paul is staying there in Ephesus for two years, that all the residents of Asia hear the word of the Lord. That the word increases, that the word is going forth in all that area. All, as Paul's ministering, all everybody in Asia hears the word of the Lord. And at the end of the text is this, this other recounting in verse 20. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. That Paul is ministering in a really dark place, in a place that is given over to magic and incantations and, and idol worship. And yet, as Paul ministers in a dark place, he has incredible success. The word goes forth. It increases. It, it prevails mightily. That we, we see this working in Paul. We see this working in the, the Ephesian believers who bring their magic books and burn them before everybody to see. They're repenting of their sin. We, we might come to this task, text and begin to ask, well, why can't that happen now? Don't you want the word of the Lord to be heard in all of Frankfurt or all of Kentucky or all of America or all the world? Don't you want the word of the Lord to increase and to prevail mightily? Why can't that happen now? And that we're tempted to think that the question this text is asking us is what must we do? If we want to see this re sort of revival that Paul sees, if we want to see this sort of success as we share the gospel, we, we must do what Paul did, right? Well, what must we do? What, what sort of songs can we sing? What sort of style can we have? What sort of programs or classes can we teach? There must be something that we can do in order to see this work of the Spirit through us, in order to, to see people come to faith and to see the word increase mightily and, and to prevail. But what I want you to see is that that is not the question that Luke is asking us. The first question he asks us is not what must we do, but rather instead what must we be? And I want you to notice that the whole text is driving us to a central question that at the end of the text you have those bookends that talk about the word of the Lord, that all of Asia hears the word, and at the, the end of the text the word of the Lord increased and prevailed mightily. And then if you move inside of that, you have an example of the word increasing and prevailing mightily through Paul as people are healed even just by touching his handkerchief. And then on the tail end of the text, you have an example of the word of God prevailing mightily through the, the new believers, these new converts in Ephesus who are repenting of their sin and extolling the name of Jesus. And then right in the center of the text, everything is pointing us to this, this little text, this little narrative about the seven sons of Sceva. They, they are asked, right? It's interesting that the, the main question in the text is asked by a demon. And he says, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I recognize. But who are you? The question of the text is not, what must you do? The question of the text is, who are you? Where do you find your identity? What Luke is drawing out for us is that the revival comes not by what we do, not by how we manipulate the spirit, not by the, the sales that we have, but revival comes by who we are, that God works through his people. And so Luke is demonstrating for us that the question we ought to be asking of ourselves is not what must we do, but instead first, who are you? Ultimately, who do you belong to? This is a question that demands an answer, and it is a question that is going to come to all of us, that you cannot escape it. This is a, a question that you're going to have to ask, and that I can't answer it for you. Who are you? Where do you find your identity? And what Luke does is he shows us through these three narratives tied together, that identity is found only in Jesus, that we want to be those who are found in Christ. So he gives us these marks of what it looks like to belong to Christ, to answer the question in a biblical way, who are you? So, just who are you? Jesus, I know, and Paul, I recognize, but who are you? First question Luke asks us is not just who are you, but, but are you a humble servant? But notice there at the beginning of the text, this, this first narrative about Paul, that Paul here is an example for us of what it means to find identity in Christ, to belong to Jesus. And Paul is showing for us that what it means to belong to Jesus is to be a humble servant. So are you a, a humble servant? What are the marks of a humble servant? Humble servants first are committed to the ordinary. I want you to see the way that, that Luke sets this up. That Paul is a tent maker, that Paul at this point in his ministry is refusing to receive assistance from the churches. Though if you read the letter to the Corinthians, Paul says, I have the right to receive it, 
but he's choosing not to take it, that he might support his own way, that he might not lay any stumbling block before the gospel, so that, that no one will accuse him of, of peddling the gospel for money. So Paul doesn't receive rep- support, but instead Paul supports himself. And how does Paul do that? He does that as a tent maker. That he stays for two years, a total ministry in Ephesus of, of over three, but for two years he supports himself in, in Ephesus by making tents. That every day he would do the ordinary job. The, the, the way that, that this would work in, in Asia and particularly in, in Ephesus is that we have lots of records that sort of describe their work day. The work day for most people, like Paul, would begin at 7, and they would work from 7 to about 11, and then they would have a, a long sort of extended break in the day from about 11 to 4, and then they would go back to work from 4 until the evening, till 9.30 or 10. And this is what Paul's doing. He's going every day to work. He's making tents from 7 to 11 and then from 4 till the evening. And in that break in the middle, Paul is going, Luke tells us, to what is called the Hall of Tyrannus. It's a a public forum. And Paul uses that 11 to 4 hour to go into this public forum and to reason with people about Christ, to disciple new believers, to preach the gospel. That This is a man who gets up every day and he goes to work and he preaches Jesus on his lunch break. And all of Asia heard the word. The word increased and prevailed mightily through Paul, that Paul is a man who is committed to do the ordinary. He gets up, he goes to work, he sweats, he labors, he preaches, he reasons, he disciples, he shares the gospel, that he is a man getting up every single day and doing it all over again. He does this for two four years, full years, six days a week, five hours lecturing during the day, six days a week uh, for two whole years. That's over 3,100 hours that Paul spends in the hall of Tyrannus over those two years, reasoning with people, pleading with people to trust Christ, preaching the gospel, that Paul is a man who is not extraordinary in this moment, but Paul is a man who is committed to doing the ordinary. The question is, who are you? Are you committed to do the simple? Are you committed to do the ordinary? Or do you chase the extraordinary, the big things in your life? But I want you to see the way that Luke tells us the story. That it's precisely because Paul is committed to the ordinary that that God makes him a conduit for the extraordinary. That that when you find that you are committed to do the simple things, to do the ordinary things, that God chooses then, by his mercy, to use our simple, our ordinary, to do extraordinary things. Notice, Luke does not tell us that Paul is doing miracles. Or that Paul is casting out demons and healing the sick. Who does Luke tell us is doing all of this work? He says in verse 11, and God was doing miracles extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. And I find it interesting that not only is God working through Paul, that's not strange, we've seen that before, but, but notice how God is working through Paul. They come to Paul while he's working, while he's at his job, and, and Paul has to make a living, and so he's not able to leave, and they say, Paul, we know that you can't go with us right now, but somebody, that's, somebody that, that you love is sick. This new believer is sick, or this person has a demon in them. Paul, you can't go with us right now, but will you give us your handkerchief that you're wiping your brow with? Would you give us the apron that's around your waist? That, Paul, would you just give us and we'll, we'll take it and, and they'll be healed or the demon will be cast out. Notice what God is doing. He is taking these sweat-soaked symbols of Paul's ordinary labor and God is using them as instruments of mercy. God is using Paul's simple ordinary work to do extraordinary things, to heal people, to cast out demons that he's using, the, even these everyday items of, of Paul. You've probably seen before or watched a show where somebody offered to sell you a, a little handkerchief that's been dipped in the Jordan River or something. You could pay $30 for that and it would heal you. That's not what's going on here in Ephesus. This is God, by his mercy, choosing to work through Paul. Even these items that Paul has touched, people are being healed. Because God takes the ordinary work of individual believers, the simple every day, and it's God who does extraordinary things through it. That's who Paul is. Jesus, I know, and Paul, I I recognize. But the question of the morning is, who are you? Are you committed to do the simple and the everyday, the ordinary of the Christian life? Because I I hate to break it to you, but the simple and the ordinary and the everyday, that is the Christian life. The Christian life is not all mountains. It is not all big things in your life. The Christian life is the simple, the ordinary, the everyday. Eugene Peterson said years ago that that Christianity is long obedience in the same direction. This is the simple life, the Christian life, doing the regular everyday. Uh, Instead, often what we find, sometimes I I speak to people who aren't willing to do the ordinary, the everyday. 
but instead they want to chase the big things. Right, they used to come and say, hey, the Lord's called me to go to the jungles of Africa. Right? I'm going to the jungle. I'm going to be a missionary. And my first question is, are you sharing the gospel with your neighbors? If you're unwilling to do the ordinary and the simple, the everyday, that my guess is that God's not calling you to do the extraordinary. Somebody comes and says, the Lord's calling me to be a preacher. He's calling me to go to seminary. He's calling me into the ministry. And I, and I ask, are you, are you even reading your Bible right now? What are you doing with the knowledge that you already have? If you're unwilling to do the simple, if you're unwilling to do the ordinary, you will not see God do the extraordinary. If you will not do the lesser, you will not see the greater. A few weeks ago, I was watching a basketball game, and my daughter was with me. She's five, and she said to me, Dad, do you think if you hadn't have been a pastor, do you think you would have made it to the NBA? <laughs> That's not that funny. I don't <laughs> appreciate that. I appreciated that she had confidence in me, and so I looked at her and I said, you know, Elizabeth, we'll never know. We will never know. I, the Lord called me at an early age. I don't know what the Lord would have done through me. I, maybe I would have been, yeah, we'll, we'll never know for sure. But she, she, she wanted to know, Dad, would you have made it? I didn't have the heart to tell her that your dad can't cut it in church league basketball, right? I got cut from the Buck Run Buckets team, right? I, I can't crack the lineup in church league. Why would I ever dream of thinking I'm going to make it to the NBA? And yet so many of us are unwilling to do the simple, ordinary, everyday things of the Christian life. And yet we wonder, why is, not, why is God not working through me in extraordinary ways? It's because you're not doing the ordinary. Who are you? Are you a humble servant committed to do the ordinary? You want to know what the, the mighty Christian life looks like? It looks like reading your Bible. And praying, being under the word of God preached, being in community with other people, waking up and going to work and working hard and serving well where God has placed you, loving your kids, reading the Bible to them, loving your spouse, being a good husband, being a good wife, these ordinary, everyday things. Commit yourself to the simple and see if God won't do extraordinary things through you. We see God here working, and, and you might think, well, of course God is doing this through Paul. I mean, Paul's an apostle. Paul writes half of the New Testament. Paul, Paul's planted all these churches. I'm not Paul. God does these things through Paul because he's Paul, not, not because he's committed to the ordinary. And unless we, we, we find that that's just Paul, notice what Luke does. He gives us an example of God working in extraordinary ways, not just through Paul, but through brand new believers. And the question is, who are you? Are you a humble servant? But not just are you a humble servant, but, but are you an obedient disciple? If you go to the end of the text, the mirroring passage is, if the first one shows us this work of God through Paul, the, the back end shows us the work of God through these, these new believers in Ephesus. That they, they've just trusted Christ. They, they hear of this episode with the seven sons of Sceva as they're beat up by the demon-possessed man. And, and Luke tells us that this tale goes throughout all of Ephesus. Everybody hears it. And notice what he says. And fear fell upon them all, and the name of Jesus was extolled. He's telling us here what God is doing through these brand new believers in Ephesus. Are you an obedient disciple? And they're marked by two things. First, by reverence. Notice, they hear this tale of the demon-possessed man beating up the, the seven sons of Sceva. They're sent out in shame, and the fear of the Lord falls on them. Not the fear of demons. The fear of the Lord falls on them, and the name of Christ is extolled. These new believers, these new converts in, in Ephesus, fear the Lord. By the way, that's how it always happens. When the fear of the Lord falls on us, the name of Christ is extolled in us. That we lift up the name of Jesus. They, they live in reverence for who God is. They've come out of a sinful life. They've come out of darkness. They've come out of what, what Luke calls the magic arts. And yet they fear the Lord. They extol Christ. They lift up his name. Notice here that, that they are lifting up the name of Jesus even though they've not really known Jesus all that long. They are not like Paul who's planted church after church after church and seen God do miracles and, and saw, saw so many people saved through his ministry. These are new believers, and yet they fear the Lord, and they extol the name of Christ. They live a, a reverent life. That's who they are. Jesus, I know, and Paul, I recognize, but the question is, who are you? Is your life marked by a fear of the Lord and a lifting up of the name of Jesus? Notice the connection here. They fear the Lord. They lift up the name of Christ. They're not just reverent, but they are repentant. This is the miracle that God does in Ephesus. 
If you were to keep reading in the book of Acts, we, you'll see that, that God does such a work in the book of, of Ephesus that the whole town becomes a riot. That they want to kick Paul out because he is turning the whole city upside down. So many people are getting saved that this, this whole city that's given over to the dark arts, given over to magic and incantations, is flipped upon its head because of the sake of the gospel, because of so many people are being saved. And these people, brand new believers, come out and they repent. They hear the story of these seven sons of Sceva and they begin to realize that their old life in the occult is no longer compatible with their new life in Jesus. And so you notice how Luke describes it. They, they come out, they confess, and then they divulge, right? They, they come out confessing and divulging their practices. They come out admitting that they too had tried what the seven sons of Sceva have done. They too practiced magic. They too relied on incantations and magic words and spells. And they come out, they confess these things. And notice they don't just give the books away, right? That in Ephesus, these books are worth a lot of money. Luke tells us 50,000 pieces of silver. It's really hard to sometimes always put that into modern uh, money. I've, heard, I've read things that say hundreds of thousands of dollars. I've read things that have said millions of dollars. Suffice to say, it is a lot of money. It's big business in Ephesus that people would keep these spell books to, to, to ward off evil spirits or to heal themselves or to make things happen in their life. You would say these things or say these things, these magic incantations. That a lot of money is tied up in these books and they come out and they say, this isn't who we are anymore. And so they bring out all their books, they confess their sin, they divulge it, and they burn them there in the sight of all. They don't throw them away. They don't just put them up on a shelf somewhere and think, I'll never use those again. But they say, we don't want anybody to be led astray by these. They take them out into the middle of the city and they burn them. They, they don't just confess their sin, but they forsake it. They say, well, we have no reason to come back to these books. We don't, we're not going to put them on a shelf and think that maybe one day we'll return to this life. If Jesus is not powerful enough, we'll go back to the occult. No, they, they take the books to the middle of the city and they burn it. They confess their sin. They, they divulge their evil practices and they forsake their sin once and for all. This is what repentance looks like. A willingness, an eagerness to repent of sin, to expose it, and to forsake it. Uh, years ago, I pastored a couple. By the time I was their pastor, they, they were already saved. But they, they told me about when they came to faith in Jesus. That before knowing Christ, they would spend their Sunday mornings sleeping off their Saturday night parties. And yet somebody was kind of a co-worker came to them and shared the gospel with them. And, and they heard the gospel and believed and were gloriously saved. That Christ saved them. And they said that for about the first six or eight weeks of their, their new life in Christ, they kept their old pattern up. That they would party on, on, sun, on Saturday uh, evening, and, and it was a little harder to get up for church, but they were going to church on Sunday morning. They were a little hungover, but, but they were still, they thought, we can do both things. And, and I tell you, nobody came to them and said, hey, you shouldn't do that. But they told me, about two months into this, it was one Saturday evening as we were preparing for the party, that we looked each, at each other and said, this doesn't fit who we are anymore. That this old life, these things that we used to do, it doesn't fit who we are in Jesus. We, we can't live this way anymore. And so they said, we don't do that anymore. Not because they were guilted into it, not because anybody said you have to do this, but because the Holy Spirit began to change them and they began to see that their old life is no longer compatible with their new life. They were obedient disciples, willing to forsake the old that they might have new life in Jesus. That's who Paul is. Jesus, I know, and Paul, I recognize, but the question is, who are you? Is your life marked by a reverence of God and repentance? That if you belong to Jesus, your life is being changed by the Holy Spirit, that you might look more like Jesus. Do you find that you look more like Christ now than you did five years ago? Than you did 10 years ago? Than you did 30 years ago? Do you find by the, hope of, the help of the Holy Spirit that you can look at your old life and say, I don't need that any longer? For that is no longer compatible with who I am in Christ. Just who are you? Are you a humble servant? Are you an obedient disciple? The, Paul was, these, these new believers in Ephesus were. But I want you to notice Luke presses in even further. Just are you a humble servant or, or are you an obedient disciple? But the, the question, the central question is again, who, who are you? We might ask it this way, are you fully known? This central narrative, the, the narrative of the seven sons of Sceva, shows us a bit of a compare and contrast, where, where both the episode of Paul and the episode with the, the Ephesian believers, these new converts, are positive. 
that this episode with these seven sons of Sceva is negative, that we, we see the opposite of what we should do. But even within the story, we see a picture of what it means to be identified with Jesus, what it means to belong to him. That these are itinerant Jewish exorcists. We're told that their father, Sceva, uh, is a high priest. Whether he's a real high priest or he's just claiming that title, we don't know. And essentially, they travel around. They exercise demons, they cast out demons, and they're in Ephesus. So they use whatever name seems to be most advantageous at the time. Whatever's working most. We'll, we'll cast out these demons by this name, and when that name stops working, we'll cast out these demons by another name. We'll find another incantation, we'll find another phrase, we'll find another word that works for us in the moment. And so they see what, what Paul's doing. They see the word of God increasing. They see that demons are cast out by Paul's apron. I figure this Paul guy is pretty good. What must we do to be like Paul? And so they come to this man who has a demon and they notice what they say. They say, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. You want to know if you are fully known? Ask yourself, are you identified with Christ? We adjure you by the Jesus, not that we know, because we don't know him and we're not known by him. But we adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims, whom Paul preaches. You notice here that, that Paul is so wrapped up in Christ, his identity is so hidden in Jesus that they, they say, well, we adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. When they think of Jesus, they think of Paul, that those two names go together, that, that Paul's life is hidden in Christ. He is identified with Christ. We, we know what this is like. We, we, we know even in our own human experience what it's like that when two people are, are so united that when, it's hard to think of one without thinking of the other. Right? When I say the name Herschel, what name do you think? Tanya. Hopefully you say Tanya, right? That Herschel and Tanya. When you say, when I think of Herschel, I think of Tanya. They, those two names just go together, right? So much so that when two names go together, sometimes it's hard to tell where one ends and the other begins, that they're, they're hidden in each other. Some of you think Chris, you think Scott. Let's just be honest. I've been at Buck Run. Scott and I have been at Buck Run for almost five years. I can count on one hand the number of Sundays that I've not been called Scott or vice versa, right? You just see us as two names that go together so much so that it just, you're unsure, right? Just be honest. Often when you see us, you're not sure which one you're talking to. You, you begin to go together. There are ways. We're not the same person. There are ways to tell us apart, right? If you, if you see us and one is wearing orange, it's probably Scott. If he's wearing blue, it's probably me. If you see us and, and you see somebody and he looks like he's enjoying a meeting, that's definitely Scott. If he looks like he is late for a meeting, that's definitely me, right? That we are different. If you see us and you see him holding a daughter, that's probably me. If he's having another baby, that's probably Scott, right? That they're... <laughs> We're not the exact same person, but our names are inextricably linked. That we, we know what it means to so be identified with somebody else that you can't separate the two. Paul is so identified with Jesus that even itinerant Jewish exorcists who do not know Christ know Paul. We adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Is your name so identified with Jesus that they would know you? The people in your life connect your name with the name of Jesus. Is your identity so wrapped up in Christ that you are identified with him, that to know Jesus is to know you, and to know you is to know Jesus. We adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. But notice, not just that. It's not just that you're identified with Christ, but when you are identified with Christ in this way, you will be recognized by the demons. This is, to me, one of the most fascinating stories in all of Acts. They come to cast out this demon. They try to do it by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. And it's the demon who speaks truth to them. We adjure you by the Jesus who Paul proclaims. And the demon says, excuse me, gentlemen. I know Jesus. And I, I know Paul. The word he uses there is a cognate for no. It's, it's a, just a synonym for the word he uses at the beginning. I, I know Jesus. And I know, I recognize, I've noticed Paul. I, I know him because I know Jesus. I, I know Paul. But we've not met. Who, who are you that you would come and try to cast me out of this man? Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, but, but who are you? That Paul is so identified with Christ 
his life so wrapped up in Christ that he is a natural enemy for the demons, that he shares the same passions as Christ, that he works towards the same ends as Christ, as his life is aligned with the purposes of Jesus, so much so that because he is a friend of Jesus, he is an enemy to the demons. They say, we know Jesus, and we know Paul because he's in Jesus, but friends, I, I don't know you. Just who are you? Ask yourself, do the demons have a reason to know your name? Are you so identified with Christ? Are you so aligned with his purposes, so share his passion, so pursue the same ends as Jesus, that the demons have a reason to know your name? At your work, on your street, with your family, are you so identified with Christ that the demons have a reason to oppose you, or are you not worth knowing? Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? It's a question you're going to have to ask yourself. It's a question you're going to have to answer. Who, who are you? It's a question that has what we would say is eternal consequences, that if you don't know who you are, you will find yourself in shame. But yet those who are fully known, those who know who they are, those who are found in Jesus aren't just identified with him and recognized by demons, but they are freed from shame. I want you to see what happens to these men. The, the demon-possessed man says, Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, but I don't know you. And then he jumps on them and he masters them all. The word that Luke uses there is the word that he uses in other places for an exorcism. What happens here is a reverse exorcism. They come to cast out the demon and the demon casts them out. You have no authority here, he says. So he, he leaps on them, one man on seven men. He overpowers them. He essentially beats them up, and they flee the house naked and wounded. They flee the house in shame, bared and bloodied. And this becomes known to all the residents of Ephesus. They attempt to use the name of Jesus like a magic word or a special incantation. They attempt to manipulate the power of Jesus, and they find themselves in shame. They do not know Christ, nor are they known by Jesus, and so they are put out in shame. You, you must know that imitation faith always ends in shame. Faith that is not genuine, faith that, that does not know Jesus or is known by Jesus, imitation faith always ends in shame, either in this life or in the next. Some of you have all the right words. You sing all the right songs. You've got all the right answers. You've got all the right outward forms of godliness. But if you're honest, they don't really belong to you. And some of you are trying to push back the darkness in your life with a borrowed faith. And what you're going to hear back from the abyss is, Jesus I know. And Paul I recognize. But who are you? There is a real enemy. He is roaming to and fro, seeking whom he may devour, and he's always hungry. That he comes to steal and to kill and to destroy, and he's very good at it, and he is not afraid of you. Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? Do the demons have a reason to know your name? We see what happens to these men. They're put out in shame. They're put out bloodied and bare. And the thought is, there is not much worse that can happen to you. But the truth is, there is something worse than being put out in shame by a demon. There is something worse than the demons not knowing your name. It's Jesus not knowing you. Pastor Scott read for us that text from Matthew 7, in which people come to Jesus ready to answer a question that Jesus doesn't, that Jesus doesn't ask. They come prepared to answer the question, what have you done for me? And so they come and say, Jesus, we've done all of these things for you. We've cast out demons. We've prophesied in your name. We've done all of these things for you. But that's not the question that Jesus is asking. Jesus is saying, what kind of tree are you? Jesus is asking them, who are you? And he says to these people who don't know Jesus, but have done lots of things for him, depart from me, for I never knew you. You don't belong to me. Jesus, I know, and Paul, I recognize, but, but who are you? If you find yourself without a genuine faith in Jesus, you will find yourself bloodied and bare. That you will find yourself like those people in Matthew 7, like these seven sons of Sceva, put out from Jesus. 
He will not be manipulated. Jesus will not be for you a convenient means to an easy life. He is not a magic spell. He is not a special incantation you can sprinkle over your life and make it easy and make it simple. No, Jesus is the Lord of the universe. And he demands that you answer, who are you? Are you found in Christ? If you are, if you're in Jesus, not only are you identified with him and recognized by the demons and, and fully known, but you are you're ultimately in this being fully known by Jesus. You are freed from sin, freed from shame, freed from all the judgment of God that was upon you. We're freed from shame, not because we don't deserve it, but because Christ has taken our shame for, from us. That Jesus on the cross bears our wickedness. He bears our shame. Think about what happens to Jesus as he's on the cross. What question is everybody demanding that, that Jesus answer? Who are you? The soldiers mock him and yell up at Jesus as he's on the cross and say, he's saved other people. If he's really the son of God, he'll save himself. Bring yourself off down, down off the cross. Just who are you, Jesus? The chief priest mock him. You're the one who said you could destroy the temple and raise it again in three days. If you can do that, Jesus, you can take yourself off the cross. If you really are the son of God, just who are you? But even the criminals on either side say to him, we, we know why we're here. We're criminals. Why are you here? Just, just who are you? If you're really the son of God, save yourself and save us. That Jesus on the cross bears the shame of his people, of those who deserve to be put out, bloodied and beaten. And yet Jesus is bloodied and beaten on our behalf. That Jesus endures the shame. That the writer of the Hebrew says that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. That Jesus bears our shame all the way to the grave. Where he is crucified, dead and buried. And on the third day, the father raises him from the grave that we might have life, that we might have victory. That now in Christ, I am freed from shame. My debt is paid. My sins are forgiven. I have the Holy Spirit, that I am, Hebrew says, a co-heir with Christ, and that he is not ashamed to call me brother. There is a better way. There is a way to find identity in Jesus. Jesus, I know. And Paul, I recognize. But who are you? God uses obedient servants, uh, some humble servants, obedient disciples. God uses those that he knows, that know him, and are fully known to do mighty things, despite their frailty, def despite their weakness, to, despite all that is happening in and through them and all the ways in which they fail. God uses them to do mighty things. Some of you are waiting for God to do a mighty work through you. But the Holy Spirit will not work mightily through you until he has worked mightily in you. The question of the text is not what must we do in order to bring about revival. What songs must we sing? What dress must we have? What programs do we need to offer? What, what things can we do to make the Spirit come? The Spirit will not be manipulated. He is not a magic word. The primary question is, who are you? Do you belong to Jesus? Are you found in him? Have you come to him in repentance and faith? That who you are is found only in who he is. That this is where we find our hope. This is where we find salvation. It is in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus. And so one day, your name will be called, and an answer will be demanded of you. I can ask you the question, but I cannot answer it for you. That one day all of this will be gone. All the world will pass away. The, the, the psalmist says that it will all be rolled up like a scroll. One day all of this that serves as a distraction for us, one day it will all be gone and your name will be called and the question will be asked and you'll have to answer it. And on that day, what will be said of you? Jesus, I know. And Paul, I recognize. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you found us in Christ. Father, we pray that even now that you might draw us to yourself. We pray even now those that might be here that haven't trusted Christ, we pray that today that they would answer the question, who are you? And that they would be found in Christ. 
Father, you are merciful to us. You take away our guilt that we might be known and fully known. Father, we pray that even now that you would do a mighty work in us and through us, that your name, even in this place, your word would increase and prevail mightily, that many might come to know you, that the saved might be conformed to the image of your son, that you might be glorified in it all. We pray that we might have the fear of the Lord, that your name might be extolled among us. It's in your name we pray. Amen.